Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, right, so I'm Max. Uh, I'm a practicing medical herbalist in Bristol um, at the Urban Fringe Dispensary. Um, and that involves basically several different activities. Primarily, uh, I see patients um, and treat people with herbs. So that's the main thing that I do. Um, I also teach. I teach a course in herbal medicine. Um, and I do talks like this. And I do herb walks around Bristol, which I've been doing for a few years now. And I teach on various other courses. Um, and it's, the teaching I do is um, kind of all sort of at an introductory level, really, teaching people how to... Um, well, a lot of it is actually more about holistic health than herbs per se, but it's how to use herbs in a holistic fashion rather than, you know, just listing what, herb, what uses a particular herb has, I suppose. Um, and the third thing that I do is I research into what's rapidly being called uh, ancestral health or evolutionary health. And that's a, um, it's a philosophy of healthcare that's based on um, the idea that uh, we live in a time of evolutionary discordance, that our bodies um, and our minds actually, to a very large extent, are optimally adapted to life uh, as a hunter-gatherer. And it's only been the last 10,000 years that we've adopted agriculture and civilization has happened. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of discordance between um, how our bodies process things and the things that we put into them. Um, so I'm going to talk quite a bit about that tonight. So actually, what, when James asked me to do this talk... I kind of saw it as an opportunity to try and bring together these three things that I do um, and try and present some sort of synthesis, some sort of view. And I came out with the expression primal herbalism because it kind of links with that whole evolutionary thing. And the ancestral memories I'm going to talk about quite a lot as well because that's something that has arisen uh, or emerged out of doing herb walks with people. So... Um, yeah, I think that kind of covers the purpose of the talk. I'm, I'm going to try and arrive at an articulation of these two things, and at the, at the end, hopefully, you can let me know how I've done with it. Um, I talked about, so I've mentioned ancestral health research, and I suppose I'll start with talking about what I mean by that. Excuse me. Ding. Yep, that's worked. Um, so, as I said, it's based. It's come out of this evolutionary discordance. Um, our minds and, to a large extent, our, the metabolizing parts of our bodies uh, evolved over an enormously long period of time. Um, and it takes quite a bit of sitting down and thinking about to actually take it on board how long that time is. Uh, it's estimated that modern humans, um, or the, the predecessors of modern humans, were around about two and a half million years ago. And that 300,000 years ago, basically the people who were around then were very, very similar to us. One of the main differences, actually, between them 300,000 years ago and us is that their brains were actually bigger. And 60,000 years or so ago, where we got evidence, the brains were something like 10% bigger. Um, the theoretical basis of uh, ancestral medicine is based on population research. So it's based on looking at uh, uh, populations of hunter-gatherers that still exist and also looking at the fossil evidence and what we can glean from the fossil evidence, particularly from the last 50,000 years or so ago. And there's been massive leaps in that recently because we can now, from a for instance, from a, a set of bones from 50,000 years ago, we can map the DNA of the, of the person 
and see what the differences are to, to them and us, and there aren't that many. Um, with that technology, we've discovered recently that, we're, uh, that there are Neanderthals in us, that we crossbred with Neanderthals when our predecessors did. It's quite interesting. Um, and also looking at nutritional biochemistry, which is a big field, but what, what we know of nutritional biochemistry, and then linking that back to what we assume would have been the diets and the uh, lifestyles and activities of, um, of our ancestors. The particular research that I'm involved with, I mean, there is a mass of information on the theoretical basis. And the thing that I'm doing is um, basically it's phenomenological research, which means it's actually examining people's subjective experiences relating to ideas that have come out of evolutionary discordance theory. So, for instance, I run 30-day uh, diet experiments with groups of people where we commit at the beginning of the process to eating um, basically an approximation of the um, Paleolithic diet for 30 days, excluding all products of agriculture and modern industry from the diet. And the process of that 30 day, we meet sort of five or six times during, during that period and map um, symptom patterns that each individual chooses themselves. And the, the research question uh, for these groups is how do we make it easier to achieve the target of just eating this food, this diet for 30 days? Because it's a really hard thing to do. Um, you know, in the, in the modern world. Uh, and quite a lot has come out of that already. Um, I've run three groups so far doing that. And the little n equals one at the bottom, uh, that refers to the, um, basically, the, the subjective nature of the research. So if you came onto one of these, uh, joined one of these groups, you would select for example, five symptom patterns that are pertinent to you that you would want to measure and see how they change over the 30 days. So really the results of the research are all anecdotes of individuals. There's nothing that can be gleaned as a group from what happens, but you can start to see patterns from it. And there's a really big point to this N equals one thing because health research and the evidence base evidence-based medicine is largely based on population studies and the what's called the golden standard the gold standard of health research is um, uh, placebo controlled double-blinded trials with large populations of people and also taking meta studies of several controlled trials like that n equals one is not that at all it's uh, it's anecdotal and it's phenomenological and subjective um, and it's, it's completely ignored by researchers, and yet it's fantastically powerful uh, and really important. The information that comes from it is really important. Um, and obviously really pertinent to the individuals that find this stuff out about themselves. So that's kind of the, what I mean when I'm talking about ancestral, the ancestral research that I'm involved with. Um, so I'm going to... That's... That's going to come in <laughs> to, uh, hopefully, when I build this narrative, what I'm talking about. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about uh, herb walks and what happens. Because it's really, I've kind of come to this research and this whole way of thinking through doing herb walks and educating people about herbs. And one of the things that um, I noticed really early on when I was doing herb walks was that people would turn up out of some sort of idle curiosity, um, thinking it would be quite interesting. You know, let's just give it a go and see what happens. And it ha virtually every time I did one, there would be people at the end who were just almost dumbstruck at the experience that they'd just had. And I'm not saying that's because of the way I was presenting it. It was because it seems when you take people, particularly urban people, into the natural environment and start looking closely at the massive variety of flora there is, 
and examining individual plants and telling stories about individual plants, something seems to be awakened, you know, something seems to happen. And something really struck me that uh, someone once said at the end of a herb walk was that it felt like coming home, which I thought was quite nice. Um, so I do herb walks mostly, I, I've done a little list of places in Bristol where I do them, but um, mostly in urban green spaces or what's known as the urban fringe, which is why my dispensary is named after it. Um, and what I've discovered um, is that particularly kind of like in the centre of town, around the Cumberland Basin, Castle Park and places like that, the diversity of flora there seems to be so much greater than anywhere out in the country. Um, last year in the Cumberland Basin around the Create Centre, I did a walk every month from, so once a month from April through to October to just look at the changing habitat to see how the plants change through the year and it was really instructive and each time I did a walk I was able to talk about 30 or 40 different plants that are all used medicinally and I think it's partly because uh, particularly along the river bank and along tracks etc the the land isn't just well this isn't managed really so uh, plants just get on with it castle park's quite interesting They've actually got a herb garden there, but there's quite a lot of wild stuff growing there as well. And I think around the docks, you just get stuff that's come off the ships, you know, so there's quite a lot of exotic stuff growing there. But anyway, um, this here, can, does that look any good from out there? No. That's uh, white dead nettles growing amongst nettles. Quite an interesting species. I'll probably talk about those a bit later. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, a herb that I might talk about, um, just to yeah, show you what it's about, really. So ground ivy is really common. It grows in clumps, uh, and it, turns, it, it sort of appears around about April. And you'd mostly just ignore it, you know, because it just looks like a little weed on the ground. But when you go and look at it close up, and I always take a magnifying glass with me. It's incredible. The flower is incredible. Um, it's really, really beautiful and really intricate, and it's, uh, it's evolved to attract particular insects. Um, it's also got specific qualities, ground ivy. Uh, it's not a particularly well-known herb um, in herbal medicine, but it is particularly effective and really good. Um, I didn't even, when I studied herbal medicine at university, we didn't really talk about grind, ground ivy very much. It's something I've discovered myself, and I use it all the time now because it's so effective. So it's a member of the mint family, and it's got a very specific taste. It doesn't taste like mint. In fact, um, I've actually bought some along, a little tincture, so you can have a taste. <laughs> um, yeah you want to pass this around, uh, the thing to do with it is just to, this is a tincture, okay, so it's an alcoholic extract of ground ivy. Just put a little drop on your hand like that and lick it up and you'll get the taste. So, yeah, the, please pass it around. It's not compulsory. Um, a very interesting thing about ground ivy is uh, specifically it's anti-catarrhal and it's really effective for clearing uh, catarrh in the head and sinuses in particular. Um, and the taste of it is mostly pretty repulsive, except if you've got an acute attack of sinusitis. Um, and this is a this is a quality that quite a few medicinal herbs have, that when it's going to be useful, all of a sudden it tastes appealing, and uh, as though your body knows. Um, so I'm going to explore that a bit later on, like the evolution of taste and how that's come about and what that quality is. Um, I've just done a little list here of <coughs> stuff that it's good for. Oh yeah, tinnitus. Uh, for 
a lot of people have tinnitus, and a lot of the time tinnitus is down to catarrh uh, collecting in the eustachian tube and having an impact somehow on the inner ear, just causing a continuous sort of high-pitched noise. And uh, if you drink tea, if you drink a ground IV tea, um, you need to drink it for two or three weeks, but it gradually clears, and it seems to work. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works, you know. And actually, a lot of people have tinnitus the whole time, and uh, this is quite a good discovery. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, it's one of those things that will come and go, you know, but it'll, it'll make it go. Can't guarantee it, but, you know, it's worth a try, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've discovered it by doing it what, on myself, basically. Someone told me to do it, and I did it, and it worked. So, pass it on. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so, I, I mentioned about the, um, that feeling that people express at the end of herb walks, where, you know, often, where pe that just kind of recognition that it's quite significant, looking at plants, because it's not something that we naturally do all the time uh, and it struck me that it might be something deeper than uh, you know just an interest being awakened there might actually be some cognitive some innate cognitive memory or f function that's being woken by looking at natural forms so I, I started researching that and looking into it and um, I don't know what's on the next slide. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, the phenomenology of a herb walk. Uh, so one of the things we do, as I've said, is we look closely at plants. Uh, someone pointed out to me the other day that uh, some research in America where they found that the average American child can recognise a hundred corporate logos, but can only differentiate four different wildflowers. Actually, we have this innate capacity for detail and for identifying plants. And it's most likely that the ability to differentiate corporate logos comes from this innate capacity to identify plants comes from this part of the mind, this part of uh, visual cognition. So it's kind of the other way around, you know. Um, so one of the things that we do is we, we, we look at things in great detail. There's also the awareness of diversity. I mean, that surprises people. And there's also this um, thing that happens with a group when you're walking around. Um, to do with being part of a group that's looking closely at plants, uh, there's some kind of ancestral memory in that process because you're the, what you're actually doing as a group is you're walking around using peripheral vision for mad cyclists and dogs, etc. You know, as you might if you were imagining you might be out sort of as a hunter-gatherer, the gathering part of being a hunter-gatherer, say, 100,000 years ago, a small group of people, you would be looking out for predators. You would have your peripheral vision would be really important, and you would have that awareness whilst still scanning the landscape, and the gr particularly the ground, for things that you could identify as food or medicines, but in particular food. Uh, it's thought that a uh, very large part of the um, hunter-gatherer <laughs> diet, cheers, whilst you know, it would obviously vary from place to place in the world, what, what we know from looking at populations that still exist is that quite a large part of the diet consists of tubers and uh, root vegetables um, that primarily women would go out and dig in groups and use. Um, and of course plants have evolved themselves, have evolved a whole load of chemicals to try and deter us from doing that so that they can thrive. 
So we have this kind of constant evolutionary battle going on. But anyway, getting back to the herb walk, it feels a bit like that. It feels like you're going out on a sort of gathering mission. And, I, I, you know, I'm not just imagining it. It really does feel like that in my imagination. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is, is you're, you're kind of creating a map. Um, some of the people who have been on my walks have, have come up to me afterwards and said this later on, that they've started mapping out where the plants grow. And you start to... If you imagine that um, you're in a land where there aren't any roads and there's no kind of permanent dwellings, there might be tracks that you'd go down, but you'd need some places, you'd need some facets in the landscape that would tell you where you were. And there's every reason to suppose that that would be plants, you know, as well. Obviously big plants, trees, but also little plants you could use to kind of map where you are. And that's possibly a different cognitive domain to the one that recognises the visual impact of the small plant, the capacity to actually build a bigger map in your head about where you are. The other thing is that what has occurred to me is when talking about herbs and uh, individual plants is the importance of narrative, of making stories up about them. It's no good just listing qualities of a plant because nobody can take that information on board. Um, so I've got a whole list of anecdotes that I tell for each particular plant. And again, stepping back from that, it's very easy to see that that's probably how information was dissemin disseminated and taught and how it has been for not just a couple of thousand years but a couple of hundred thousand years. You know, we know that language has existed for such a long time. And that's quite, a, quite an incredible thing to think about, that that capacity for learning about uh, what we call natural history, the natural history domain, is so old and archaic. Um, feels like coming home when I said that. So... Yeah, so what I want to um, talk about now is the, the environment, what we call the, the evolutionary environment of adaptation. Uh, what do we know? What theories are there around at the moment of, of where this stuff's coming from? Um, the Paleolithic era is uh, it, well, it's divided into three parts, which are called the lower, middle, and upper. Paleolithic, and the lower Paleolithic started about two and a half million years ago. So, and the, the upper Paleolithic finished about ten thousand years ago. So, we're talking about the massive amount of time during which human consciousness evolved, and during which our bodies developed as well, according to the environment we're in. Um, if you take two and, a half, uh, two and a half million years ago as your starting point, then the evidence suggests when what we might call culture, art, and uh, that sort of thing emerged, which was a, at the earliest, about 50,000 years ago, that's really relatively recently. That's really recently. And... Uh, there's this picture here this, at the bottom. This is the, um, this is the artwork in the Chauvet Caves in southeast France. Uh, these were discovered. These caves were discovered in the early 90s, and that, these pictures were painted 34,000 years ago. They're the oldest uh, kind of known bits of cave art in the world, and they're incredible. Their complexity, um, the technique that they used, is just mind blowing. What's also interesting is that we're talking about, uh, you know, southeast France. There are pictures of lions and giraffes, and um, what looks suspiciously like an elephant in one place. So, kind of what we thought about the geology, or well, geology, the climate at the time, is probably wrong. Um, the Upper Paleolithic environment which is kind of from 50 or 60,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, 
is probably the most interesting to study because it's the one that we've got the most evidence of, um, archaeological evidence. And it's also the, the, you know, it's the time during which culture has evolved. From two and a half million years ago to 50,000 years ago or so, all we've got is hand axes. And um, we, I mean, different types of hand axes, but not many. <laughs> you know, it's kind of extraordinary that um, things just didn't really develop. Technology just didn't really develop for two plus million years. And then suddenly, bang, uh, they were doing pointillism. They were doing kind of like impressionistic paintings and uh, developing hunting technology. And then 40,000 years ago, or 40,000 years later, agriculture came along. So something happened, uh, you know, something really key must have happened during a fairly short space of time, about 50,000 years ago. Maybe we, were visited. Maybe we were visited, but there are some more plausible theories <laughs> um, about how the, how, about what changed. Um, okay. So we go to the Upper Paleolithic. Uh, we know from the Chauvet Caves and from the artwork that's around and from artefacts that the flora and fauna were diverse. Okay. It used to be thought they weren't. It used to be thought that we were, our kind of Northern European ancestors at least, were living in birch forests and just living off woolly mammoths and, you know, a few other big beasts and having a quite a hard time. But... It, it's looking now like actually things were a bit more diverse than, than that. Uh, we have large brains, fully developed capacity for language. So there's no reason to suppose that we didn't have a fully developed grammar and language. Um, and we, there was definitely a natural history domain. Uh, we would have had to have had this facility in our brains for mapping out the landscape, for understanding predator behaviour in particular, and for being able to identify plants, edible plants, medicinal plants, um, and, you know, have a, having a pretty good understanding, at least, of the natural history of our environment. And the, what I was talking about earlier on, the phenomenology of going on a herb walk, the things that happen, that is probably where we were. You know, we would be learning in groups, we would be telling stories about plants, we'd be passing the information on orally, and there would be a massive tradition of, of that sort of learning. And w again, I'll just kind of mention this again, this is over periods of tens of thousands of years. Uh, so it's an awfully, awfully long time. It's a long time for these stories to develop and for our knowledge to, to develop. When you consider that, you know, what we know now, our culture now, is based on little more than 2,000 years, or actually 500 years, really, in this country. Right. Um, so there's been quite a lot written in the last 20 years or so on the evolution of consciousness relating to the archaeological evidence that's around and from suppositions about how we are now. But again, I mean, it's, this is all quite recent. Um, drawn on the, largely on the works of um, Leda Cosmides and John Tooby, who um, are a couple who kind of more or less single-handedly created evolutionary psychology in the 1970s. Um, and out of their work has come an awful lot of really interesting ideas. Uh, there's a guy called Stephen Miffen, who's a professor at Reading, who's written about, um, he's written a book actually called The Prehistory of, the, of Consciousness, and, uh, which is really, really good. Um, one theory is that the mind is like a Swiss army knife. It started, the, the evolution of human consciousness started with a mind that was like a Swiss army knife, in that there were several uh, different elements to the mind or domains that had specific functions. So you might actually have a part of your mind that is specifically adapted to the equivalent of removing stones from horses' hooves or something like that. But 
actually the idea is that we had these particular domains of knowledge that were innate, that we're born with, where we can assimilate and um, think, perform mental acrobatics really quickly relating to these specific domains. And the kind of Mithun has defined four domains of intuitive knowledge, which I'll just come on to in a minute. Um, but there's a kind of, yeah, there's, no, there's overwhelming evidence now looking at child psychology that children, by the time they're three, they seem to have developed specialised mental domains in specific areas. Uh, whereas when they're first born, you know, newborn babies, they just have a kind of generalised intelligence, but they don't have any specific stuff. This is all to do with the theory of learning and why it is that kids learn so quickly and pick stuff up so incredibly quickly. It's because our minds have developed specific domains for dealing with specific things. Um, and yes, the next one will be what they are. Yeah, the, the, the four domains that Stephen Mithen talks about that are kind of tangible and observable from archaeological evidence as well. He talks about uh, technical intelligence. So that's kind of the uh, part of your mind that can do things, that can make things. And the technical intelligence, when related to Paleolithic people, is particularly about stone tools, because that's mostly what they, what they made. Um, but to make stone tools, the stone tools that uh, have been found in caves in Africa that date back to over two million years ago, to make these stone tools requires a mind that is much more developed than our nearest uh, other species, chimpanzees or bonobos. Much more developed than chimpanzees or bonobos exhibit now, two million years later. So even two million years ago, we had the capacity to do stuff that other animals can't do today. Um, social intelligence is another domain which is about re obviously relating to people. The bigger the brain, it seems, the larger the functioning group can be. So, so there's a kind of direct looking at how it is assumed how our ancestors lived socially. As the brain got bigger, the social groupings got bigger too. Um, natural history intelligence, I've already mentioned a bit. That's really about acquiring food and um, not being eaten, avoiding predators. So that's uh, another domain. And limb linguistic ability, which Noam Chomsky's written extensively about, is possibly, this is the same as social intelligence, it's in the same domain, but it seems that we have an innate capacity for grammar and all humans share that. So there it seems to be a common grammar amongst all human beings all over the world. So our, you know, we're not born with a blank slate, our minds, we're born with the ability to, to develop language. And I think that's a really good example of what I mean by domains, or what is meant by domains, is that the domains you're born with, mentally, are uh, our potentials to develop things, to develop mental capacity. The theory is, He's uh, looking at his book. Oh, yeah. Um, S Stephen Mithen's theory is that uh, at some point over 50,000 years ago, when the change happened, when culture arose, we developed a thing called cognitive fluidity, where the domains, these separate domains, started blurring with each other. Um, there's a theory about child development that talks about three phases of development in a child, where to start with, there is generalised <coughs> intelligence, which is slow, uh, but capable of recognising, differentiating between objects. You know, and the first thing is recognising mother, I suppose, and then differentiating <coughs> out from there. Then... After a while, domain-specific modules supplement general intelligence, which work in isolation. So parts of the mind, there's parts of the mind that can deal with numbers. There's another part that can deal with social intelligence, with playing one thing off against another. And there's another part of the mind that can deal with 
like objects that are non-self and recognize living things and non-living things, those kind of things. And then finally, there are domain-specific modules that start working together. When a child starts being able to articulate thoughts and ideas and bringing together two different things. Um, uh, this, this, is the, this is basically illustrates what Mithun is talking about with cognitive fluidity, I think, is when these domains start to cross over. He came up with this um, metaphor, which he called the cathedral, the mind as a cathedral. And the, the idea that he had, which I think is just brilliant, is that in a cathedral you've got the central nave and then coming off the outside you've got all these different chapels that have their, you know, like for different saints or whatever, where they burn the candles. And the, the chapels would represent the different kind of specific domains and the nave in the middle would represent general intelligence. And I think what, what, what he means by general intelligence or what's meant by general intelligence is, is a, this kind of fairly slow um, but recognisable thing that you, as mind, it's, animals have it, okay, a dog has general intelligence, uh, it, can, it can mimic and it can recognise commands and that sort of thing, but it's pretty slow, it can't actually consciously, well, one assumes, I mean, you, you never know with a dog actually, but uh, it can't bring together different things and formulate ideas. And uh, Arthur Kostler called talked about how the sudden interlocking of two previous or unrelated skills or matrices of thought account for human creativity. All of a sudden an idea occurs to you. You know, that the phenomenology of that when you're just kind of, I know, doing something, suddenly an idea crops up. Um, it is very often if you think back, you can see it coming from different parts of, of yourself. Uh, quite hard to see, but that's the theory. So there's this idea that uh, 50,000 years ago, basically, this started happening. You know, it started becoming common that people could take information from, for example, the natural history domain or, and start applying it to the technical domain. So, hey, we can make a new tool for digging a tuber out. We don't have to use this stone axe anymore. Um, or, you know, we, look, I've made a bow and arrow kind of thing out of twisting this piece of twine from a stick. Um, and the big kind of cultural change occurred when really technical, the technical domain and the natural history domains crossed over into the social domains and we started accumulating knowledge for its own sake. Um, it was time we tried another herb. So, does that make sense? What I've been saying, yeah, good. Um, I'm going back now to the kind of phenomenology of plant perception because uh, plant perception is really, really important uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer. I've talked a bit about the visual field, about how we have this natural ability for recognising very, very small patterns in nature. That's how we're going to differentiate between two different plants, one of which might be food and one of which might be deadly poisonous. Um, the attribution of intention. What that means is, uh, or what I mean by that, is if you, uh, if you imagine, rather like when I did my walks last year around the Create Centre on the Cumberland Basin, seeing individual plants change through the season. If you, uh, if you look at a plant and you, st you get to know it over five or six seasons, say, whilst you're growing up, um, you'll start to see that it's not a single thing. You know, it's not like you can accept that people change quite slowly, but you're looking at a plant and it changes pretty damn quickly. You know, one day it's not there, the next day it is. You kind of, that's pretty amazing. 
and it changes form quite quickly and then it seems to just disappear. And uh, we would have been, our ancestors would have known um, pretty well how to use a lot of plants um, you know, for quite naturally for healing and for just simply flavouring food and would understand quite a lot about them. Um, but how would they, I mean this is completely theoretical, how would they consider this object, this plant? It wouldn't be uh, a single thing, it would be another living thing. We, they would know, they would have known that it was a living thing, it wasn't a stone, you know. And there would be some, uh, well, complete acceptance of what it is, but also some understanding that it's a changing form. And if it has a specific purpose, if we're looking at something like ground ivy again, we understand, you know, you drink it, it gets rid of your catarrh, then there would be an attribution to that plant that that was what its intention was. That it was, you, you, you might start by seeing a kind of really small little shoot and see, see it change, see it sort of grow into a, a few leaves and then a plant, see the whole morphological change. And the understanding of what that plant is would be its purpose, its intention. The intention of this thing is to be used like this. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's very different to how we see natural objects, how we see plants. Well, it's very different to how most people see plants. Most people would see a plant as being a fairly fixed thing. The species, that's about it. You know, it's not that much more interesting than that, than that. You can either eat it or you can't. And what that kind of points to is what I call a pre-agricultural -agricult equanimity. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, equanimity is a state of uh, kind of neither being happy or, nor depressed, but being stable. And th this is a state of understanding that things are entirely as they are and that you can attribute meaning to stuff according to its uses and there's no need really for any more than that understanding as long as it's useful and it enables you to use it or not use it if it's dangerous. And we're also considering about a, a group of people who were living at a time that was very dangerous, you know, there were natural predators out to kill us and eat us as well. So. Uh, Whilst we might experience great stress and hardship um, with having to sleep out in the winter and all that sort of thing, we wouldn't necessarily uh, experience the, the same level of mental and emotional stresses that we experience in a more disconnected environment in the modern day because of this idea of the intention of other living things. And you know this whole thing of pre-agricultural equanimity. Um, I've mentioned, in, well, I've written down there, embedded knowledge. This is an idea that uh, once you know something about the natural habitat, it's the same idea really. It becomes embedded, and it's it's not that it's not open to question. It's just that it is actually your mind becomes part of the landscape and the landscape's part of your mind, you know, it's a different thing. Uh, but this is the, the thing that has been occupying me most recently is taste. Because of the work that I've been doing with the Stone Age diet groups, looking at food addictions and looking at particularly the concepts of liking and wanting of foods. Um, and what it is that makes us crave food, particular types of food, and why we like some foods and why we don't like others. And um, I've got some examples from, from, well, basically from my herbal practice of uh, specific tastes, um, complex tastes, that people rather take for granted um, without considering really that 
we have taste buds. We've evolved taste buds. We've evolved, we have genes that have survived the process of natural selection for expressing taste buds that have a specific survival purpose. And the taste of bitter or the taste of sweet is not a completely given thing. You know, the reason why we uh, have taste preferences is to guide us in what we eat. Um, and there are, we know from tastes that to a great extent, our taste preferences are acquired from, you know, identical twins will like completely different things. Um, but we also have a set of innate preferences. We have a kind of an innate matrix of taste that helps make up our kind of wanting and liking. And the only way to examine, to, uh, yeah, to inquire into our taste preferences and what they might mean for us as a kind of physiological healthy entity is by self-experimentation. There isn't any collective data that you can call on because taste is an entirely, entirely subjective phenomenon. Um, but, let's go to the next slide. Um, we're going to go into it in a bit more detail about the kind of evolution of taste. Uh, like I said before, it's kind of really important in the regulating the intake of food. Um, common sense suggests that the sweet taste is good and nutritive and that the bitter taste is bad and potentially dangerous and uh, potentially harmful to health. However, the bitter taste receptors are possibly the most interesting because um, the one thing um, I've learned as a herbalist is to differentiate between different types of bitter. When I was training, things that uh, bitter herbs tasted really disgusting to me, but I now quite like them. I've acquired the taste and I can differentiate between them. Some of them still taste awful, but... Um, some seriously poisonous substances in nature, like cyanide and strychnine, have a very bitter taste. Uh, and clearly, our bitter taste receptors are archaic, and the genes for encoding them are really archaic and protective. But the, looking at the... Um, now we can decode you know, the genetic code for t bitter taste receptors. We've found about 30 different genes that make up, which is when you create a matrix with that, that's a massive variety of different taste receptors. We have very, very different taste receptors to our nearest relatives, to chimps and bonobos, even though, you know, we're kind of relatively recent evolutionarily. It was only six million years ago we parted company with them. So in the last six million years, we have humans have developed very, very sophisticated ways of differentiating between bitter tastes. And the reason for that, I would hypothesize, it's completely obvious really, is that there are some substances in nature which taste bitter, which are highly, highly beneficial. Um, and at times we've, had, we've lived in ecological niches where it's been really necessary to eat bitter substances for our health. Um, and if you look at some of the big families of culinary herbs, like the mint family, which includes thyme and mint and rosemary, you know, for starters. Um, they've all got bitter, they've got um, these compounds in them called sesquiterpenes, which are bitter tasting. And you can discern the bitterness underneath the taste of the pure herb. And yet something shines through from the flavour um, that has, it seems to have a sense of purpose. So... Uh, also, the mechanics of, of uh, taste perception for bitter and sweet in particular are quite different from the, the mechanics of perception for salt and sour. And it's thought that the salt and sour taste uh, facility for doing that actually dates back to when we were marine animals. 
you know that's a really archaic part of ourselves and it plugs straight into the amygdala and the really ancient parts of the brain whereas the bitter tastes uh, seem to light up more recent parts of the cortex in the brain so these Oh, yeah. So there's this thing called uh, allesthesia with herbs, and I've kind of briefly mentioned this before, uh, which is that with ground ivy, when you, when you need it, if you've got sort of some acute catarrhal sort of sinusitis or something like that, it will taste an awful lot better than if you don't need it. There are some really cracking examples of uh, allesthesia in practice. Um, one really notable one is uh, an American herb called Bone Set, which uh, herbalists learnt about from Native American Indians when doctors went over to America during the kind of frontiers time. Uh, Native Americans used Bone Set for curing fevers because the, the kind of Westerners bought fevers with them, you know, and Bone Set was one of the main herbs they used to treat the fevers. And uh, what Bone Set does basically, you make it as a tea and drink it when you're feeling really ill uh, and it brings the fever on it won't suppress it, it's not like paracetamol or anything like that, it actually the reverse it encourages the fever and it will bring you to the point of sweating but it's also antiviral and uh, it's, um, it tastes really foul except when you're feeling really ill in the first stages of flu when you've got that you're starting to ache and you're feeling cold and tired and just like you're about to die. Uh, if someone gives you a pot of bone set tea, you don't want anything else. It's, uh, it just, it's just the thing. Your body goes, yes, please. That's, you know, that kind of implies that there's a, we know, <laughs> our bodies know, our bodies tell us, bring it in. And this is obviously, this is something that animals do all the time. You know, and going back to the Native American Indians, when they talked about medicines, they talked about bear medicines and they talked about wolf medicines and basically a bear medicine was a plant that they had learnt about through observing the behaviour of bears. So like echinacea for instance, this famous American herb, is a bear medicine and uh, when bears come out of hibernation they go and grab some echinacea and they rub it all over themselves and they eat it, the root. Um, and they kind of know what they're doing because they're, you know, they when they come out of hibernation they are extremely vulnerable because they're undernourished and they're weak and echinacea gives their um, uh, immune system a real kick to fight off anything that might be lurking. Um, having found out about bone set from the American Indians when it was brought over and grown at Kew it was discovered well people noticed how incredibly similar it looked to uh, hemp agrimony, which is this. Hemp agrimony is fantastically common. It grows everywhere. You definitely recognise it, you know, in August. It's all over the place. So, more lately, we've started using hemp agrimony. It does exactly the same thing, and it's really odd that we didn't know. You know, there's no reference to hemp agrimony in medieval herbals or any sort of written texts about using it for breaking a fever. Um, but it really does, and it's, uh, it's great. So, it, you know, this is a brilliant adaptive part of taste. Thank you. So, um, actually, I've only got probably a couple more slides to do, and then we can just chat and questions and answers, that sort of thing, which is good. So, did we do this? Yeah, we did this. So, um, it's talking about the evolution of taste and the kind of uh, uh, evolutionary stable strategies, the, the things that drive uh, adaptation in evolution. And I've just listed some kind of fairly common combinations using herbs that we all rather take for granted. Uh, Actually, if you consider these in a kind of evolutionary sense, look at the history of it. Thyme and chicken. Thyme goes particularly well with chicken. 
Um, and if you're making like a chicken broth out of the carcass, it goes exceptionally well. Thyme contains um, essential oils, thyme oil being the main one, which are excreted through the lungs. And uh, one of its major uses medicinally, thyme, is to um, is as a kind of bronchial antiviral and uh, antimicrobial. So the action of time, when it's excreted through the lungs, it basically enhances your immunity by killing off microbes and attacking viruses at the site where you're being infected. And chickens, in particular, are a very common source of viral infection, with bird flu and all that sort of thing, um, and always have been. So is it an accident that time tastes good with chicken? Uh, or have we evolved a preferential taste for this specific herb? It sounds balmy when you think about it, but actually when you consider what I was talking about before, about the sheer amount of time, you know, the two and a half million years, we've been cooking for 750,000 years, I reckon. So 750,000 years of chicken broth, or cooked chicken and time. It's a very, very long time, time. <laughs> very long period. Uh, mint and lamb is another, it's kind of almost a better example, mint and lamb, mint sauce and lamb. They go really well together. Why is that? Well, mint contains, again, these uh, terpenoid compounds which uh, stimulate the secretion of emulsifying enzymes from the liver and from the pancreas. And mint lamb is a very fatty meat. And basically mint sauce cuts through the fat and enables you to digest it. Um, and so, lamb and mint sauce. Um, two herbs that go together, turmeric and black pepper. I mean, this is not local, but, uh, you know, Indian subcontinent, it's been around, turmeric and black pepper have been around as a combo for, since time began, <laughs> probably <laughs> itself. <laughs> and uh, they, turmeric on its own tastes all right, it's a little sweetish and it's got its own peculiarity, but you add a little pinch of black pepper to it and suddenly it's fantastic. Um, and it seems to work as a kind of uh, taste sensation um, we're not talking about chilli here, not talking about just heat. There's something in black pepper that makes turmeric specifically good. And actually, we now know that the, it, there's an alkaloid in black pepper called piperine, which uh, increases the absorbability of turmeric, because turmeric's so sticky, it's, you don't absorb much of it. Most of it passes straight through or just coats your insides and turns you bright yellow. Um, but black pepper increases the absorption of turmeric by a factor of 20, piperine. And turmeric is an anti-inflammatory, <coughs> it's a fantastic anti-inflammatory. Um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you just take a load of turmeric, like turmeric capsules or something you can buy in Holland and Marat, etc., you'll absorb a little bit of it, but not much. If you add a bit of black pepper, then you'll absorb most of it, so you don't need to take as much. Um, is that an accident? I don't know. Do they taste so good together? Probably not. You know, probably an adaptive process. And <laughs> sorry, I apologise to vegetarians. These are all quite meaty um, <laughs> <laughs> examples. <laughs> but then, you know, we are talking about undergatherers. Um, beef with mustard or horseradish. Um, both mustard and horseradish contain these compounds called isothiocyanates, which are again antimicrobial and um, specifically good against uh, to help one protect one against parasites that might be living in the um, particularly in the organ meats of of these animals, uh, and they seem to taste quite well, quite good as well. They seem to mix quite well together. Uh, you kind of think, oh, these things have just been handed down, they're acquired tastes. This could be another argument. They're just acquired tastes because the tradition has been handed down. But it's 
funny how the tradition seems to be fairly uniform across <coughs> cultures and across races. You know, that somehow people who eat beef and uh, kind of bovine, like um, buffalo, those sorts of meats, tend to find brassicas to eat with them, which have got these isocyanates in. So that's something that's kind of quite interesting to think about, you know, that these, these uh, complex tastes in herbs and the way we use them have kind of co-evolved with us and we sort of innately know how to use them. One of the uh, problems with one of the criticisms of herbal medicine, one of the problems of being a herbalist, when you talk to kind of conventional health practitioners, they say, where's the evidence? Because there hasn't been a massive amount. There have been you know, some uh, studies done, there have been some tri clinical trials done, but nothing like the ones that are funded by drug companies. But when you consider these kind of ideas, the evidence is right there in your mouth. That's where the evidence is about herbs <coughs> and about our use of herbs. You don't need any more than that when you start to examine your own taste preferences. You know, if something tastes really good, the chances are there's a reason for it. Um, a bit lost here. Yeah, so what, um, what I've tried to do, or what I'm attempting to do, is pull together some of the ideas that I've talked about tonight into a... <coughs> not really a manifesto, but like a framework for understanding my own practice. Because my own herbal practice has changed pretty radically over the last two or three years since I've been looking at the, um, particularly at the Paleolithic diets and at hunter-gatherer health issues. Um, so I'm kind of developing this idea of primal herbalism. Uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm launching a blog this week and it's based on looking at the health of hunter-gatherer societies. Why would I do that? You know, what's so great about hunter-gatherer societies? I mean, I can tell you a few things, all right? Hunter-gatherer societies that exist at the moment in the world uh, that have been studied, the, there's various societies in the South Pacific, notably, notably the Kitavans, who exist on a little island, the Trobriand Islands, who, who live primarily off uh, yams and roots and fish and very, very occasionally they eat pork. But they don't eat any grains at all. They don't have any refined sugars. They don't eat any refined oils and they don't eat any dairy products. They also, they don't have any heart disease. They don't have any diabetes. They have a very, very low incidence of cancer. They don't have osteoporosis. In fact, there's a huge list of things that they don't have in their society. Um, they're very lithe and athletic. This kind of idealised notion of the noble savage being really healthy, but it's true in their case. And it's a pattern that's replicated around the world in other hunter-gatherer societies. Um, it, uh, and these studies are kind of relatively recent, so it's a kind of, it's a developing field, but it's really interesting to, to note that that's the case. Also, looking at Paleolithic remains, from what can be f gleaned from looking at the bones of our pre-agricultural ancestors, they were quite healthy. Their life expectancy was a lot shorter than ours, but that was mainly because of infectious diseases and predators, and that, that you know, they, they had a very high infant mortality rate. But the ones that <coughs> lived to an old age, lived to a ripe old age, as old as our old people do, and were very healthy with it. Oh, another thing they don't seem to have in Catawba and places like that <coughs> is uh, senility and Alzheimer's. Um, and I've noticed through doing these uh, experimental diet groups <coughs> how people who've had long-standing um, chronic conditions that you might attribute that seem to be common in the West start to often start to get better and repair themselves and I've just witnessed some quite extraordinary results that have been far far more impressive than anything I've achieved just using herbs um, and there's more to it that, uh, to looking at uh, hunter-gatherer kind of diet than 
just looking at the food. Uh, there's a whole set of other things that one starts to consider about work patterns. Agriculture bought us um, hierarchy, bought us hierarchical societies, bought us the working day, the work ethic, um, and generally a work, an eight-hour working day, but very often more. And it's th that's kind of the majority of the world now live in uh, agriculture-based societies and have division of labour and have unequal societies and have this uh, daily circadian routine of getting up in the morning and working all day and then going home. It seems in hunter-gatherer societies, um, when we're left to our own natural devices, we live on four-hour cycles and we have an immense amount of energy for four hours and then we need to rest for two or three hours and then we have more energy for four hours and we sleep a lot as well. Um, uh, th this is one of the most interesting things about what happens during the 30-day experiment is that people's energy levels start going haywire and uh, there's a kind of considerable period of adaptation that's needed and I mean 30 days is not long enough really, it's kind of scratching the surface but it's long enough to see the differences of what happened. Um, other aspects that I find really interesting are looking at exercise and rest patterns. If you, th if you think about uh, what, a, you know, in a kind of fairly reasonable climate, in a fairly reasonable environment, what uh, Paleolithic people would have done during the day, they would have probably done short, intense bursts of exercise, like, you know, chasing a wild boar through the woods or something, um, picking, thing, picking heavy objects up, like a dead animal or a big pile of tubers, but they wouldn't really have done that much continuous um, endurance type stuff. Although there is a really big argument to say that we're very well adapted to endurance, that our hunting pattern is about running for a very long time because we can't outrun a gazelle, but we can run for longer than a gazelle, so we'll catch it up, and eventually it will get exhausted, and then we've got it. So we can kind of both do both, you know, uh, endurance, um, aerobic sort of fitness, but also this kind of short burst stuff. And from a, a point of view of health, uh, it seems that um, doing short bursts of exercise seems to be better. It seems to um, it improves kind of uh, metabolic, um, improves insulin, blood sugar levels, and uh, your general metabolism, how your body uses energy. It makes your body more efficient. Whereas um, kind of running marathons and uh, sort of pounding around the downs every day, doing something like that is quite stressful. Uh, feels quite good, but it's also quite stressful. <laughs> so my practice, I was just kind of talking about my practice, how it's developing. I'm tending to use herbs now more as an adjunct to diet and exercise and stress reduction. And stress reduction, uh, you know, there are the trendy thing in the NHS at the moment is mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is kind of okay. But I consider... Um, a very holistic part of my practice is to not shy away from things that actually create stress, the political system that we live in, and to fully embrace the fact that it needs to change um, and that we're living in times that are discordant and that are kind of set up to enfeeble us and make us ill. And I think that uh, that's <coughs> a major part of herbalism is enabling people to deal with that um, and to find structures in their life that can, you know, day by day help one to cope with the onslaught on our lives that's been created by capitalism. Um, and uh, one of those onslaughts that I perceive, uh, just in my practice, is the tyranny of evidence-based medicine. The definition of uh, evidence as being only something that is achievable through academic institutions and through uh, population-based studies. And I think that we need to take it back 
and say that we are scientists. We are people who can explore and discover and think and assess the evidence and work it out for ourselves. And we can experiment on ourselves freely. And we don't need to listen to what we're being told by vested interests. I'll give you a really good example of what's happened. I've to rant here, but a really good example of something that happened last week. There was a, a woman on Woman's Hour who uh, was, came on because she's obese. And she was really brave and she said, I'm obese, I've been fat all my life. And I've tried lots of different diets for losing weight and I'm struggling. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So Women's Hour wheeled on the government spokesman on obesity, Dr. Sue Jebb, who was chairing the government committee on obesity, but is now their sole scientific advisor, who asked her what she'd been doing. And she said, well, I tried a low-fat diet for a while and it worked for a bit restricted my calories but I, I really didn't enjoy it I didn't get on with it but I did lose a bit of weight and Sue Jeb said well that's what you've got to do we've just got to accept you know that some of us are overweight and obese and you know we just have to accept who we are and if you've found something that works then do it Sue Jeb uh, was the chair of the obesity committee which resigned en masse over the government's ties with the food industry and she's the only remaining member She's scientific advisor to Kellogg's, Heinz, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, and Nestle. She's quite rich. Um, and you just kind of listen to that, and you just, you know, that's how it is. So we've got to take it back from them. We've got to say to the, the so-called authorities, the scientists, you don't have the authority, you know? playing with our minds. So that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, trying to get people to experiment on themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make a point. I think there are a lot of scientists uh, who are researching now who are also at odds with the corporate world. Yeah. And they, they lose their jobs, they're not getting um, published, etc. So they're all coming together with us as well to mm. try and make changes. Yes. I kind of think that the, that's right, I think that's happening. I think that ch there's a change happening in academia. But it's very difficult because of funding, you know. It's a, yeah. <coughs> No, 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 I wouldn't criticise the scientific method. Yeah, yeah, exactly, good point. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, you mentioned about um, the Women's Hour and the holistic approach of helping people, of like cope with, you know, like the capitalist culture and political systems and the stress reduction. Like, what kind of work do you do around that? Is it kind of related to herbalism or is it kind of developing other kinds of techniques or...? Yeah, um, mostly relating to herbalism. Oh. I teach a herbal medicine course, and like I said before, I'm doing this doing this diet group. But there's a sort of it's affected my practice in as much as when people come and present, particularly with mental and emotional conditions, um, I I kind of re relate them back and say, well, these are the things you can do. Okay, from an evolutionary perspective, you can try this that might work and you can try these herbs but actually in a bigger sense you also need to start um, reconnecting with the animal that you are because that's a way to uh, overcome some of the these kind of toxic hormones that are produced <laughs> uh, well I'm still kind of working on them at the moment exercise um, lifting heavy objects uh, you know, um, g g grouping together with other people to form um, buying groups for food in particular. <coughs> it's all quite new stuff, really. Uh, um, I mean, I'm not, you know, there's loads going on, isn't there, in Bristol? So I'm kind of looking out for other people as well who are doing useful things. Yeah.
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, d I tried uh, running barefoot around the downs <coughs> last summer. Big mistake. <laughs> I couldn't walk for about three days afterwards. Yeah, so I found out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a good thing to do. Are you chasing a gazelle? Yeah. <laughs> if only. Yeah. So you mentioned your 30 day diet um, camp, uh, program. Is that something that you seriously need to be on a retreat for those 30 days? No. Because it sounds like if your um, patterns start to go crazy, if you're holding down a normal job and living yeah. the normal kind, that sounds like that could be very interesting. Do you need to do a retreat or is it just. No. no? Okay. You just carry on. I mean, there's. I think. Uh, yeah. So, how does that work? You, you, you have a plan to say eat this for 30 days? or we, you, you Yeah, it's more like don't eat this for 30 days. So, like don't. <laughs> you know, okay, don't on. eat um, <coughs> grains or dairy products, essentially, and quite a few other things as well. And then we meet. That's why we have sort of regular meetings at least once a week okay. and have a, like, a forum, kind of support forum. But the point is to try and do it normally. In your normal life, but I do tell people at the beginning that to watch out, because in the first week in particular it can be really hard, and you know you might need to take a few days off work. Like days four and five are usually pretty tough. Did you do? Oh yeah, I do it all the time. Oh, you, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Do you now do it all the time? Well, no, not quite all the time. But I mean, I do the when I do the groups. No, but I mean, is that your diet? Like you don't. Yeah, uh, do the ish. Yeah. What about raw dairy? Is that raw dairy? Not in the 30 days. No. There's quite a lot wrong with dairy. Um, the way that uh, milk is produced now, you know, the hormones that they give cows to make them produce more. It's like, I mean, I'll give you an example. Okay, my, I've got a 19 year old son, Felix, who's six foot two. And I, I couldn't help noticing when he was in the sixth form that all his friends were six foot two as well. and a fair bit taller, a lot of them. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's, the, it's now thought that... I assumed it was because we were feeding them really well. <laughs> they, well they, they were really it sounds like the Americans, Americans tend to be bigger people, don't they? Yeah. And maybe they've had more growth hormone in their cattle. Well, it's it's, um, it's called insulin-like growth factor yeah. one, which is in dairy. It's always in dairy, mm. but it's, there is much more of it in modern cow's milk than there used to be. And one of the things that it does is it elongates the leg bones, the long bones in the body. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you'd think that being tall isn't such a disadvantage, but actually there's, it's associated with um, heart disease and uh, well, coronary heart disease later on in life. Do you find that these people that do the 30-day program, whatever it is, do they want to carry it on? And and yeah, a lot do. A lot of them do. A lot of them do. You do get adverse reactions. So I've had a couple of cases of people who had, uh, you know, previous conditions. I mean, people who, for instance, people who've got the gallbladder problems shouldn't do it because um, it's because of fat metabolism. But so there are certain types of people you've got to tread carefully with. But a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's actually revolutionary. Yeah, they come out of it completely changed. So it's not safe for everyone. It's not. No, I mean, I would, you know, kind of talk to you first about. But it's generally safe. Look, I mean, it's, the, it's an approximation of the diet that we've been eating for two and a half million years, bar a couple of hundred. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> if you t one of the things um, I did at another talk was to have a le length of rope to demonstrate how long we've been eating as a hunter-gatherer. Uh, you know, just like hunter gatherer style, the sort of Paleolithic diet. And the rope would go from sort of like the big, the, the entrance there to here to represent the amount of time that we've been evolving eating this diet. And the last bit of it, the last half of my thumb, okay, that much, is agriculture. There's an extraordinarily long time yeah. that we didn't eat grains. And... Uh, Ayurvedic diet at the moment, and the guys there reckon that brown rice 
is the perfect food. Mm. And I quite like my rice and dal, and it feels mm. really good. So yeah. I'm really interested what, in, in this almost like alternative view that grain is not so good. Well, I wouldn't say it was an alternative view. I'm, you know, it's just kind of um, what we are. Uh, it's a tricky one, that, because by and large people are okay with rice. Actually, I think brown rice is worse than white rice because the husks on brown rice have got phytates in which you stop you absorbing other vitamins and minerals. So uh, if you were just to, to eat a diet of brown rice and you know just a few other things, you wouldn't be very well after a while. It's better to be organic, I suppose. But it does, yeah, it can do. Yeah. So in that way, would then it be okay? Well, it's a, it's a very um, energy dense food, rice. Mm -hmm. Carbohydrates generally are very energy dense. So it, it's, um, I mean, there's a reason why we eat carbohydrates, you know, because they are a fantastic source of fuel. But our bodies aren't particularly adapted to dealing with that density of energy. So we end up producing a lot of insulin and end up becoming <coughs> resistant to the amount of insulin we're producing. And that's the major problem. Mm. Hmm? Well, no. <laughs> Pes pescatarians would be all right. If you, if pe people who are okay eating fish and seafoods are all right. I mean, the Katavans, the, you know, one of the main populations who have been studied, they hardly ever eat meat. They just eat it on ceremonial occasions, maybe once every two months. But they do eat quite a lot of fish. And they do live in a tropical paradise as well. You know. uh. Yeah. Um, has there been any uh, work done looking at the differences between um, I don't know what you have to call it really, the kind of exercise you're talking about, what the, uh, the scientific animal societies have engaged in, you know, actual sort of, for want of a better term, uh, functional exercise, you know, catch the, catch the gazelle, get, get dinner, yeah. build a home, yeah. and the kind of exercise that we end up doing in the environment we live in, where it's go for a run. Um, I'm big, basically, I, I'm a very lazy person, and even though uh, I'm told that you know going and exercising um, will you know make, better, make me feel better and, and it's really good for yeah. me, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I'm out, like uh, you know, uh, working with with friends, uh, building stuff, or, or, or you know, go, like there's actually a project or, or a, 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 a point to it beyond my own health, like I get really involved with it, and it makes yeah. me feel better. I wonder if there's any sort of yeah, that's way better, isn't it? Probably feels way better to do that. Yeah. Yeah, or dancing, yeah. I mean, I think there's one of the... Um, I'm working with someone who was a Tai Chi teacher who's developing some uh, sense of kind of embedded movement. You know, kind of drawing from the same philosophy, really, of uh, kind of becoming the animal. So it's developing uh, flow movements based on animal movements, on our kind of natural animal movements. The idea, kind of underpinning idea being that, you know, you can't really change your body until you're really living in it. And doing these movements is a way of really kind of getting back into your body and out of your, out of your mind. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Mm. Something um, quite liberating about doing it as well, because when you start to uh, push soft limits using those exercises, I think something affects your kind of mental outlook. Uh, you start to realise how much you build kind of uh, barriers around you, both physically and mentally. And I think that doing, you know, re-engaging with this kind of uh, animal nature actually makes people more able to take risks 
in life and you know more able to live a decent life you know to find out who they are Yeah. You shock it out of the system. No, what they do is I don't think it's a shock it's something to do with the earth ring. Mm. And the earth energy. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the herb. It depends where it is. I mean, generally, I don't pick herbs in the city. I just kind of identify them. Actually, sometimes I do. Um, and some herbs need drying. Some are better used fresh. I mean, as a herbalist, I make tinctures mostly. I do dry herbs and use them as teas as well. Would you say tinctures are the most effective way to... Yeah, they're the most, yeah, they're the easiest, the most efficient way. Doesn't yeah. it depend on the part of the plant as to yeah. the method that you should bring it in? Like, you know, flowers, a tea, or the roots, or Yeah, uh, d yeah, you need to be using the right part of the plant, uh, for sure. And uh, which part you're using will uh, dictate how much alcohol you use and you know, how you prepare it really. Each plant has got its own individual requirements, I think. So, uh, one more question. Yes. <laughs> you know how you're saying, like, some people start to create kind of uh, map in their like, minds of where the plants go in the city? Yeah. Have you actually made, like, a, an actual map? An actual map. With, mm. like, different plants in different places? No. Like, no, I haven't. <laughs> no, I think that's just kind of more of a mental map of, that I have. There is a, there's a, on Brandon Hill, someone's done a map of the plants up there. On this kind of yeah. One thing. What, I, what I'm doing at the moment is I've got um, someone who's uh, just qualified as a herbalist is uh, mapping out Castle Park and we're going to put it on a phone app. How modern is that? Yeah. Oh, God, oh, go, go on then. Just going back to your stage diet, do you find that um, I did a raw food diet for quite a long time and I found that when people first started doing it that they got an instant detox from dependent obviously on what their diet was like before mm. and helping people with that they it was quite intense you find that when people come into the stage thing is it really intense like that or is it slower it's an individual thing with some people yeah. it's really intense some people don't notice much difference at all yeah. but most people feel something yeah, yeah. okay Yeah. But how, I mean, how, how similar is um, the animals to herbs and plants? Uh, well, they experience them quite differently, but uh, very differentially. I mean, animals have, some animals have the most incredible sense of smell, don't they? That they will be able to map their territory according to how it smells. That's pretty common. Yeah. Depends on the animal. Yeah. yeah. So, do you just have one more question? Go on, yeah, 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 go on. Just if you wanted to volunteer to do your diet, yeah. do you want volunteers? I'd, well, I'm recruiting for the April group, yeah. I've got a website. Oh. <laughs> 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 that was just so happy. I have websites. Okay, so um, seriouslystoneage.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's. Uh,
That's all the information about the Stone Age diet and the research groups and kind of recruiting for the next group, which is in April. And then urbanfringe.org, which is my dispensary, has got all the herb walks and everything. Although it hasn't actually got any on at the moment, because I'm Where scheduled it. Hmm? Where is the shop? Uh, top of Christmas Steps on Colston Street. It's amazing, go there. Everyone should go there. <laughs> <laughs>